We're all comforted by the thought of God being eternally loving, which He is. We get that lovely, warm feeling inside when we read of God being our mighty protector, our shield and defense. He certainly is all of the above. We love the fact that God is forever merciful. He is kind and gracious. However, allow me to say this sternly. God is not to be mocked. Oftentimes we can deliberately sin. We can deliberately disobey all because we think that the nature of God, His kind nature, we think that His nature will overlook our wrongs. However, this is not the case. God hates sin. The Bible in Psalm 5 verse 4 says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. He is a God who doesn't delight in sin. He takes no pleasure from it. That's why the wages of sin are death. The Lord is too righteous and holy for sin to even be in His presence. He's, he's too pure for that. And so what happens when God gets angry? What happens when people sin day after day and mock Him? What happens when people forget that the Bible says in Exodus 34 verse 14, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. What strikes me about the children of Israel is that they were set free. They were led, cared for, and blessed by the Lord, but yet still found a reason to complain. Their hearts were ungrateful and they sinned with their unthankful attitudes as they murmured and complained. Now the Bible reads in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. The decision to overlook the goodness of God led to an outpouring of His wrath. So you see, God is loving, but He is not to be mocked. He is patient, but He is not weak. So we should not provoke Him to anger. You can't deceive Him or think that you can pull a fast one on Him. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient and all-knowing. Have you ever sprayed a water bottle? Next time you do, look at the water that comes out. It's a mist. It's here one second, gone the next. The truth is that our lives are the same way. We're here one second, then gone the next. Since life is so short, we need to submit to and obey the words of Christ. The book of Ecclesiastes has much to say about the brevity of life. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2 says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. This word for vanity is the Hebrew word habel. Habel can be translated as vanity or transitory. One minute we're here, then the next were gone. Many scholars believe that the author of the book of Ecclesiastes is a king named Solomon. If there was ever a person who had it all, it was Solomon. Now, Ecclesiastes 2 verse 1 in the Amplified Translation says, I said to myself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure and gratification, so enjoy yourself and have a good time. But behold, this too was vanity, futility, meaninglessness. At the time, Solomon was known as the wisest man on earth. People would travel from great distances just to see him. When it came to wealth, 
He far surpassed anyone at the time. He was as wealthy as Bill Gates is now. When it came to sexual pleasure, he had far more than any man could handle. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had every earthly desire a person could want, yet at the end of his life, he realized that it all mattered not. He was going to die and leave all that he had accumulated. The same is true for us today. When we get to the end of our life, it will not matter how great of a position we had at work, how much money we have, or how lovely our house is. Almost everything we own will end up in a garage sale or a trash dump. What will matter is if we listen and submit to the words of Christ. Solomon tried the same thing. Ecclesiastes 2, 4-6 says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Solomon had many more resources than you and I. However, his houses, vineyards, gardens, and parks are no longer standing. The wealth he had? He lost the day he died. And eventually, all that we have will not be left standing. Maybe we pivot by saying that we'll leave a legacy instead of accumulating wealth. There is some goodness in leaving a legacy. However, that legacy will die as well. Do you know who your great-great-grandparents are? Probably not, and that was not very long ago. Your great-great-grandkids will probably not know you. Even if you become famous, people may remember your name, but they do not truly know who you are. Many think they can live the life they want now and submit to God later. You may think you will have more time later. However, you don't know how much time you actually have left on earth. Remember, life is a mist. It's here one second and gone the next. Due to that, we need to live with urgency. Tomorrow is never promised. If you hear Christ knocking on your heart, now is the time to listen. The promise in the Bible is actually not for tomorrow, but today. In the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed we will see tomorrow. Instead, focus on your relationship with God today. You have a chance to repent and turn to God at this very moment. You may say to yourself, I will turn from my sin later when I get a little older or more financially secure. God is calling you to repent now. Once, a family was sitting outside on their porch, watching a storm come rolling in. The rain was heavy and the wind even heavier. Suddenly, they heard the tornado sirens go off. Four out of the five family members ran to the basement to hide. The father decided to keep watching the storm. His family yelled for him to come down to the basement for protection. He said he would, but he wanted to wait a while longer until the storm got a little more dangerous. The rest of the family did all they could to get him to the basement, but nothing worked. Eventually, a funnel cloud dropped down from the sky right on top of their house. After the tornado ripped through, the family in the basement was safe. However, the father did not survive as the tornado threw him a thousand feet through the air. Many of us are like this father. We're waiting for just the right time to repent. Maybe we have some sort of sexual sin we want to hold on to. We may have a sinful habit that we don't want to let go, or maybe we're in a relationship we know we should not be. We're waiting for just the right moment to repent. You may be waiting just long enough to enjoy your sin as much as possible, but not too long so you will not carry it into death. 
The truth is, we don't know how long we've got. Life is transitory. We're here one second, gone the next. We have very little control over when that will happen. In light of that, we need to repent now. We need to repent before the storm comes and sweeps us away. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 1, verse 16. It reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Listen to those words. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. A lot of people in this world have things that they're proud of. And equally, a lot of people have things that they're ashamed of. Now, when it comes to us, as children of God, are we ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we ashamed to say that I am a Christian who believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Are we ashamed to say that I am a Christian who believes that one day the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Are we ashamed to tell our coworkers things like, I believe that heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. And if you reject Jesus Christ, you'll spend eternity in hell. But if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you will enter eternal life. Saints, are we ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we ashamed to tell our friends and family that we all need to turn towards Jesus Christ and repent? For the kingdom of God, it is at hand. As believers, we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should not be ashamed of the gospel because the devil and the world, oh, they are aggressively spreading a message of deception. The devil in this world is aggressively trying to lead people away from the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, it is time that we, as believers of Jesus Christ, Stand up and declare to the world that there is a Savior. There is someone who can set you free if you're bound. There is a Redeemer, and His name is Jesus Christ. Saints, we should not be ashamed of the gospel, but Christians must stand up and fight for the gospel. We must rise as sons and daughters of the Most High, and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. We must proclaim, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And so I encourage you, be bold. As the voice of the world gets louder, the voice of the church must also become louder. The voice of you and I as believers must also be louder. And we must tell every soul we can that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is King. So saints, don't be silent. Refuse to be silenced by the world. Tell them of Jesus. Speak of Jesus. Shout about Jesus. And do not, do not ever be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ.